Hey everyone, welcome to Dalton Draws, the series where the title tells you exactly what the show is. Today, I want to take a look back on a game that meant a lot to me as a kid, from one of my favorite game series. That's right, we'll be returning to Flowerbud Village to draw the cast of Harvest Moon 64. We'll of course start with the protagonist. Growing up, I always thought this guy's name was Jack, but apparently the canon name is actually Pete? I don't know where I got the wrong name from, but there's a lot of info about this game that isn't super well documented. Pete in particular is a bit of a mystery. You might be surprised to find out that he was the hardest character to draw in this entire project. You see, there's a lot of official art for him in later entries of the series, and his appearance on the cover art doesn't quite match the rest of the game. As such, I drew from those other games for reference, and while I was a bit concerned that it looked a little too much like Harvest Moon DS's style at first, by the time I was finished, I was happy with how it turned out. And of course, while I'm editing the video, I happen to find a bunch of official artwork that would have been very useful as reference material. Oh well. One last note on him. His official art for the game shows him with a green hat, but his in-game appearance has the standard blue hat from every other entry. Blue probably would have been more accurate, but I decided to go with green since I was trying to match the official art style. Next up is Ellie, the girl from the bakery in Flowerbud Village. I tend to like the really sweet characters in these kinds of games, and Ellie was always my favorite of the cast. To prepare for making this video, I revisited Harvest Moon 64 and played through the first year. In that time, I got to really appreciate all of the sweet events that happened with her. Like for instance, one rainy day I was out there clearing the field and she shows up to bring some food. Those events are really nice. Even if, as an adult, you learn that a fair amount of the events are shared between all of the Bachelorettes. For instance, one I distinctly remembered from childhood was that at one point she sprains her ankle by the river, and you have to help get her back to the bakery. But every one of the girls has their own version of it. They all have an event where they get sick, an event involving a dream, most will stop by the farm at least once, and so on. But even despite the shared nature of a lot of these events, I still really like them. They feel a little more natural than some of the later hard events in the series, though those do have their own charm being longer scenes with more dialogue. Let's move on to the next Bachelorette from the game, Popery. Gotta say, it was interesting going to the flower shop in this game compared to some of the later entries. There's so few options for what to plant! But at least the shop tells you up front how much the crops will sell for, that's actually super convenient. If you've only played some of the later games, you might wonder why I'm talking about the flower shop with her. So if you don't know, Harvest Moon 64 and Harvest Moon Back to Nature feature the same cast of characters, but with different roles and personalities. Later entries on the Game Boy Advance and DS use the Back to Nature iterations of the characters. Personally, I feel like her role at the flower shop in Harvest Moon 64 was a more natural fit for her design, definitely more so than having her work at the poultry shop in later games. That said, I do like both interpretations of her, and her redesign in the Friends of Mineral Town remake on the Switch definitely works better for that iteration of the character. I gotta say, I loved playing that remake, but as someone who grew up with 64, seeing all of those characters in different roles definitely took some getting used to. Let's talk a bit about Maria, because I think she's one of the characters where the remake absolutely knocked it out of the park. Her updated design in the Switch game is so good! In general, I like most of the redesigns, I want to be clear that I'm not knocking those designs at all. It's just that the original designs are so strong that any change is going to be a bit harder to accept. But Maria's redesign is definitely great. Ellie is the only other one where I think the new look is on the same level as the OG look. Now, that being said, I do think the redesigns fit the Friends of Mineral Town versions of the characters more. Heck, the artist that's done the character artwork for the series for years talked about this in an interview just last year. They mentioned how they loved the designs for Harvest Moon 64, but felt those designs weren't well suited to the different setting and personalities of their later appearances. And honestly, as much as I love those old designs, I think they're right. Eh, that said, if they ever return to 64 for a remake, I would hope they stick to the old designs, or at least closer to them. But that's just me. Returning to 64 after playing so much of Friends of Mineral Town, it was weird seeing the old version of Anne. In the Switch game, she's the nice, sweet girl that helps out at the end, and is also called Ran, since the game uses more literal translations of the names. But back in 64, Anne was the super energetic and over-the-top girl that worked on Green Ranch. She's got some pretty funny dialogue, too. 
One of my favorite lines is right when you meet her for the first time. She's trying to see if you would be a good fit to take the extra horse from the ranch. She asks her brother Gray, and he just says no. She turns around and is just like, Sorry about my brother. He's a social disaster. <laughs> I like that she's a bit of a hothead, but that trait gets to be a little less charming when she marries Cliff. Their relationship is a bit... Eh, questionable. He has a few comments afterwards that kind of implies she might be abusive towards him, which, of course, is not cool. But it's also one of the elements that makes this entry feel a little more real than some of the other ones. Even with the rival marriages, not everyone ends up entirely happy, and that's life. But on the subject of the less cheerful aspects of this game, Grey is kind of a prick, and I love that. I love that he's a jerk! I feel like rude characters have gotten less common in these kinds of family-friendly games. Just look at something like Animal Crossing. The characters in the original game on the GameCube were so mean at times, and it was hilarious! Nowadays, there's the occasional snarky dialogue, particularly in conversations between villagers rather than with the player. But overall, everyone is super nice and cheerful and pleasant. The same is often said when it comes to the rivals in Pokemon, and how the series drifted towards those characters being your friends. Players want a character to battle that they love to hate! Defeating your rival in X and Y, for instance, it wasn't satisfying, because you just watch their self-confidence shatter with every loss. Come on, game, I don't want to feel bad for winning! That said, uh, Sword and Shield at least had beads, so they're willing to bring that back and... Okay, I realize I'm rambling a bit, but the point is, I like that Grey is a bit of a jerk. They're not in this game, but I also really like Jamie in Magical Melody for the same reason. They're the rival farmer, and they're just so dang condescending. Grey's kind to his animals, though, and that's what's really important. One other standoffish character also happens to be the last of the Bachelorettes in the game, Karen. She's one of the standout designs in the game, and certainly one of the more memorable members of the cast. I should note, for most of the characters, I tried to include something in the art to reference their job or family. Ellie had bread from the bakery, Maria had books from the library, Popery had flowers from the florist, and Anne was drawn with animals from Green Ranch. For Karen, I drew her with some wine bottles, but I opted not to draw her drinking wine because, well, she's got a fair amount of dialogue showing that she's an alcoholic. As such, I wanted to be sure that I was representing her family's winery tastefully and not making light of that. Instead, for her illustration, I chose to represent a notorious glitch in the game that a lot of players really like. So, in these games, typically you can only give one gift per day to raise affection, but for whatever reason, if you show Karen your dog over and over, your affection will keep going up. If you do this in a place like the bar, where time doesn't pass, you can max out the relationship in a single night with this glitch, which is just about one of the most simple but silly glitches I've ever seen. <laughs> One last thing I'll say about Karen is that I never went through her storyline as a kid, so I don't think I ever knew about the whole Save the Vineyard plot. I might try to complete that on my current playthrough. Speaking of subplots that I messed up, I've got a weird history with Cliff. So, at some point in the spring, you'll get up in the morning and you'll find him passed out in front of your farm, and you can give him some food. But I wasn't ready for this. I had no food in my inventory and no crops were ready to harvest. So I thought, alright, I'll run to the mountains really quick and grab some berries and herbs. I grabbed the food and returned, but he was already gone. Now I'm the jerk that didn't feed the starving traveler. I legit felt bad for that, but hey, at least I tried. But here's the thing. That's not the only time I failed the dude. In Friends of Mineral Town, I didn't know about the Get Cliff a Job subplot until it was too late and he decided to leave town. At least I was playing the remake, where he'll return later on, so I can try again. From my understanding, in the original, if you mess that up, he'd leave permanently? He can also leave in 64 as well. I've screwed up his other subplots, but hopefully I can at least get him to stay in Flowerbud Village. Cliff's not the only one that can leave town, though. Kai might leave. And so can Karen. I probably should have mentioned that with her. Whoops. If Karen leaves town in the second year, and you're not good enough friends with Kai, he'll decide to leave as well. I'll be honest, I've never spent too much time with Kai as a kid, so he probably left in my old playthrough. Karen was never the girl I went for, so as a result I never spent too much time at the vineyard, where he works. And in Friends of Mineral Town, he only shows up in the summer. Unless you marry him, of course. As a result, I just never saw him too much. I'm trying to fix that in my current playthrough of Harvest Moon 64, though. 
But he's... unfortunately not the only character I've barely talked to. I'll be totally honest, I kind of forgot that Harris was even in this game, and he's one of the rival Bachelors! The original plan for this video was to draw the Bachelors and Bachelorettes, and uh, I had to look up who Harris was at first. I, I barely saw him in the Friends of Mineral Town remake and talked to him even less. And in 64, you just pass by him on your way to the town and he doesn't have much to say. He'll just talk about the mail and the weather. It's real riveting stuff, I know. At least, if you don't get to know him. I've noticed that when I stop by the bar occasionally, you'll see him there just sighing to himself. I never went out of my way to talk to him before, but now I'm a bit curious to learn more about him. And in the time since writing the script, he started to open up a bit more, so maybe I'll go out of my way to get to know him even better. If there's one character I'd prefer not to know, however, it'd be Jeff. I don't know, man. I like his design, but I don't particularly like his character. Mainly because his role as the rival bachelor for Ellie just feels a bit weird given their age difference. It's especially weird after playing Friends of Mineral Town and seeing his goofier, clearly older redesign. Doctor served as a better rival, which... Seriously, can we just take a moment to appreciate that character really quick? He's literally just named Doctor! Even in the remake, they didn't change his name! I don't know why they decided not to give him a name, but I personally like that. It's just kind of silly. So, when I was picking characters to draw for this video, my original plan was to just draw the Bachelorettes and the rival Bachelors. So I thought, okay, of course, I'll have to draw Rick, he's a classic character. But he's actually not one of the rivals in 64. He was always one of my favorite characters from that game. I love the kind of extravagant way his letters announce new items being in stock. I just get this letter one day that says, THE CHEST OF DRAWERS HAS ARRIVED! And it's just a shelf, dude. It's a pantry. I do distinctly remember having to go to him to get the blue feather when you propose to someone. It seems like such a simple part of the game nowadays, but as a kid I remember that being such a big deal. I think it took me forever back then to advance the relationships enough to get married. What was a big deal was trying to get the music box subplot in my current playthrough. I knew where to look, but not how much to dig. I had to try digging it up several times throughout the spring and even the summer before I finally got it to appear. I never would have expected that to be such an ordeal, but hey, I got it. I'll be honest, of all of the characters in this video, Zack is probably the least important. I mostly stuck to the bachelors, the rivals, and a few important characters. So why is the guy that picks up your shipments here? I'll be honest, I just wanted to draw him. And this is an art series after all, I just love his design. I'm a big fan of cartoonishly buff characters in a chibi art style, as you might know if you read my webcomic. A few of the heroes and villains in that use a similar design aesthetic, albeit a little more detailed. The Carpenters in Harvest Moon 64 also have a similar design, and I honestly considered including them. In 64, Zack is just kind of there to me, but his design always stuck out in my memory. In Friends of Mineral Town, however, he had a really goofy redesign and I kind of love that one too. He has a more quirky personality there, and that suits it perfectly. Another classic design is the mayor of Flowerbud Village. I don't think his name is ever mentioned in the English localization of the game, but in Back to Nature and Friends of Mineral Town, his name was Thomas. On the subject of localization, a lot of his dialogue is weirdly blunt, but most of that comes from the text size. Text spacing is definitely a common issue in older games like this, but in this case it's excessive. The text in Harvest Moon 64 takes up so much space. Like, each row of text can only fit like three words. The text limitations lead to the characters being somewhat blunt in this game, which is something I actually kind of like. In other entries, they sort of dance around the heavier topics, like your grandpa dies and characters will have a whole paragraph talking about how much he loved the farm and how important it was to him. But here, the opening scene of the game is literally the characters just talking about his death in no uncertain terms. It's less wordy than the other games and more direct. I also just want to take a moment to appreciate his uh, redesign in the Switch remake. Look at that hat! Why is it so tall? I remembered that the Harvest Goddess was in the game, but I couldn't get her to show up until the summer. In Friends of Mineral Town, throwing anything into the pond would get her to appear, and there's rewards for getting her to appear daily for a month. Here, she only shows up when you throw a crop into the pond, at least as far as I know. And it's not even a guarantee then. I guess because of that, encountering her as a kid felt like a much bigger deal. Like it was this mysterious element of the game. The kind of thing you'd hear schoolyard rumors about. Though, you know, maybe not for this game in particular. I don't think Harvest Moon was really the talk of the town back then. 
I had some friends that played it, but not many. I also included one of the Harvest Sprites here. It was interesting seeing their limited role in this game before later games made them way more important, and way more helpful. From what I understand, there was some content planned that involved them, but it was cut from the game. Seems like the kind of thing that would be kind of cool to add back in if they ever remade it. Interestingly, with these two designs, I have completely opposite opinions about whether I prefer the OG look or the redesign. For the goddess, I definitely prefer the original more, though I do kind of like the sassy look of the redesign. For the sprites, on the other hand, the redesigns in Friends of Mineral Town are great. I do love the oversized collars of the original, however. So that's all of the characters for this video, but before we're done here, I want to cap things off with one last illustration. One that's a little more in-depth. So, originally, the idea for this video was to draw the bachelors and bachelorettes from Story of Seasons Friends of Mineral Town. The idea was that I would draw the original designs, and then I would draw the redesigns in the original game's art style. But as I kept adding characters to the list, I realized that the scope was just going to be a bit too ridiculous. I loved the original designs, so I wanted to focus on drawing those. And since Harvest Moon 64 was my favorite game in the series, it made sense to focus in on that entry instead. So, what's my history with Harvest Moon and Story of Seasons anyways? Well, as a kid, Harvest Moon 64 was legitimately one of my favorite games. I have no idea why it resonated with me so much. Maybe it was just the characters? It's hard to say for sure. I remember playing the game a lot, but I honestly can't remember a whole lot of specifics from those playthroughs. I remember liking Ellie the most, and I remember a few of her heart events. Like I mentioned earlier, the sprained ankle event stood out the most because it was so unexpected and it happened without fanfare. You see her there and you could, in theory, just walk by. Or maybe the game would stop you, but I've never tested that theory and I certainly have no intention of doing so. But part of why I don't remember the specifics is because of how I tend to play these games. I always play through the first full year, but after that, I don't know, I, I tend to restart because I enjoy the start of the game so much. I like building up the farm, clearing away all of the weeds and stones, buying and raising the animals, expanding the house, and when all of that starts to dry up, that's when my interest tends to die down. This isn't always how I play though, and I'm sure in Harvest Moon 64 I would have completed the game at least once, though I doubt I would have gotten the good ranking at the end. Even despite my tendency to only play one year, I do think the game's two-year goal is really smart. It can provide a challenge and encourages multiple playthroughs to experience things differently, especially with how fast time moves in Harvest Moon 64. Of everything I noticed going back to it, that was definitely what caught me off guard the most. 64 was the entry I played the most, and that one is definitely still my favorite. But I have played a number of other games in the series. I didn't play it personally, but I remember watching a bit of Harvest Moon Another Wonderful Life for the GameCube. A few years later, I really got into Harvest Moon Magical Melody for the same system. Looking back, I think that game is probably where my one year time span for playthroughs came from, because the characters in that entry are so one note, and when the farming stops being interesting and the progress felt less challenging, I just didn't feel an incentive to keep playing. That's not to say it was a bad game though, far from it. I played it so much because I actually really liked it. I loved the chibi art style and the way the environments looked. It gave me some real Animal Crossing vibes, despite the two not really looking that much alike at all if you actually compared them. After this is where I sort of fell off the series, however. I did play a bit of the Super Nintendo game on the Wii Virtual Console, but it was hard to go back to that one. But as for the later entries, did I get any of those? Well, if I had to point for any one reason for why I didn't, it would be Nintendo Power, of all things. I read that magazine a ton as a kid, Every time they'd show a new Harvest Moon game in the magazine, I'd get really excited. I remember the article about Harvest Moon DS pretty distinctly, and being so hyped about it. I hadn't seen the Game Boy Advance games before, so when I saw that one, it looked like a DS version of 64, which was all I would have ever wanted. But then they gave it a low score, and I heard about the game-breaking bugs in it, so I never got that one. Then the next DS game didn't look that great to me, and it only reviewed slightly better than DS. The Wii games I remember getting decent reviews, but I really wanted a handheld entry. Then the next DS game only reviewed decently, then the next one reviewed worse, and so on and so on. A big part of this is that the series didn't change much from entry to entry, so reviews weren't very high and we're often talking about how little it added to the series. But I wasn't looking for anything new, I just wanted a good handheld entry and never knew where to start. 
Eventually, when the big publisher shift happened, where the English name of the series changed to Story of Seasons, I decided to finally jump back in. I had heard good reviews, and I liked a lot of what was there, but I don't know, man, the simplified farming turned me away from it. Farming wasn't entirely what I liked about those games, but it was part of it, and without that, I couldn't get hooked. Eventually, I learned about Friends of Mineral Town from watching YouTube channels like Peanut Butter Gamer. So when that finally released on the Wii U Virtual Console, I didn't play a ton of it, but I loved what I played and wished I had known about it sooner. And that brings us up to now, at least with this series. I got the Friends of Mineral Town remake on Switch and fell in love with the series all over again. I love that the game came with the reversible cover mimicking the old Game Boy Advance art. I love that it came with an actual manual, and it even had like a little cute little comic at the end. That was so neat! I love the return to chibi designs for the characters. I love that the writing was sharper, but the farming wasn't simplified. It reminded me of what I loved about the series and brought me right back in. So what is it about Harvest Moon 64 in particular that made it my favorite entry in the series? There's definitely aspects of it that haven't aged particularly well. Things that would be fixed in later entries. The menus are cumbersome, feeding animals is a hassle, and there's few options for crops and animals. But despite all that, when I returned to the game in preparation for this video, I still got hooked all over again. A big part of it is the characters. While some of them are very sweet, it's not all sunshine and rainbows in Flowerbud Village. Characters are blunt, and their problems feel real. Some characters are clearly alcoholic, others are struggling with depression and don't talk much. There's implied abuse, and even death. A surprising number of characters are lacking one or both of their parents. The game certainly guilt trips you if your animals die, that's for sure. Some humans die, and other characters leave town. But despite the heavy themes in the game, there's a certain warmth to it all that's hard to describe. Those themes aren't pleasant, but they help to draw the player in and get them invested in what happens with these characters. And to a certain extent, this is a big reason why Stardew Valley clicked so much with me. I got to playing Stardew once it arrived on the Switch, and let me tell you, having that game on a handheld system was a dangerous combo. I put so much time into it. There's so many quality of life improvements compared to Story of Seasons and Harvest Moon. More animals, more crops, more things to do, better mining, more to work towards, a better sense of completion. It has a lot of what I look for in these games, but I'd be lying if I said it was able to dethrone Harvest Moon 64 in my heart, even if that's just nostalgia talking. <laughs> I'm not really a big fan of the character sprites or the portraits, and let me be abundantly clear, that's not a knock on the art itself. I think it's well done. I just prefer the 90s chibi anime aesthetic used by a number of the Harvest Moon games. While I was working on this episode, I actually had an idea to make a mod for the PC version to give it Harvest Moon style portraits. I don't know if I'll actually go through with that idea, but hey, it could be fun. And with that, let's wrap up this video. Thanks for listening to me ramble about a farming sim for 20 minutes. <laughs> I don't know if anyone actually watched all the way through this, but hey, if you did, thanks for watching. If you like my work and want to help support the show like these awesome people here, you can head on over to Patreon. Patrons backing even a dollar a month get behind the scenes content, early access to my webcomic, and even the chance to vote on themes for future episodes. Tune in next time for more art. Thanks for watching. Later.